This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Okay, so I'm recording this uh, at an auspicious moment in which, uh, according to the media at least, uh, we just narrowly avoided a collapse into World War III. I think that was somewhat of an exaggerated uh, uh, construction of uh, what happened. Um, I don't think uh, Iran, for example, would be crazy enough to actually try to confront the United States. Uh, my own view is that they handled the situation very smartly. Uh, they responded and told the United, well, via Iraq, they told everybody what they were going to do and where it was going to happen. So their response was uh, uh, measured uh, and it allowed everybody to get out of uh, the possibility of an actual confrontation. But one thing that did happen in the middle of it was a very curious uh, feature was that uh, when Trump was thinking about uh, how to respond to a potential Iranian response, uh, he said he might hit uh, cultural uh, phenomena in Iran. And this provoked uh, a whole kind of outburst in the media of uh, how barbaric Trump was being by uh, suggesting that he would take down uh, cultural iconic monuments and and the like and i I fell to thinking about some very peculiar features of uh, warlike activity uh, and uh, the idea that uh, that somehow or other uh, cultural institutions and cultural uh, sites should be avoided in conflict and this parallels a whole set of uh, rules of war, which strike me as very strange. Uh, I think actually they, it comes out from the 19th century uh, when the armies of the main European nations uh, were constructed in a way in which uh, the commanding officers all came from the aristocracy. So the Germans would have the German aristocracy, the, uh, the British would have the British aristocracy, uh, the Austrians would have the Austrian uh, aristocracy. And if those nations went to war, I guess the convention arose that if you captured somebody, they were actually of your own class. So you treated them like uh, decently, like class prisoners. And so it's like the upper classes of Europe had a code between them that, yeah, even though their nations went to war with each other uh, periodically, uh, they would not uh, uh, actually when, when uh, the conflict came, uh, interfere, if you like, with the class privileges uh, of their opponents, um, which, which made for very strange situations. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you had a British royal family which came out of Germany, and Britain went to, to war with Germany in uh, 1914 and 18, which created a certain kind of difficulty but it was handled in this kind of uh, genteel, let's call it gentlemanly kind of way. Uh, and it is, I think, a, a very standing practice, which is even carried over to the United States, that there are class divisions within the military apparatus. Uh, the upper classes effectively are uh, commissioned officers, uh, which come out of a particular training program and therefore uh, separate uh, from the enlisted officers who are the people who do the fighting, whereas uh, the generals all come out of uh, another class. So you have this class character uh, uh, which is embedded in uh, national uh, conflicts. Uh, that carries over even to the nature of the sorts of targets which you would take on. For instance, uh, uh, the Germans in, in neither the First World War or the Second World War never tried to bomb Buckingham Palace, uh, nor did they try and bomb any of the Queen's residences like Windsor Castle or anything of this kind. So there is this code uh, in which cultural institutions, which are very often the cultural institutions which attach to a particular ruling class and a ruling order, tended to be 
uh, ruled out of uh, order in terms of airstrikes and military, uh, military operations. So there is this curious class history of warfare uh, which carries over into the response, even in the United States, to Trump's declaration that uh, he was going to have 52 sites uh, which were up for being attacked, and some of them were cultural sites. And everybody would then said uh, how barbaric this was. Now, I'm of the opinion that culture is broader than a few cultural sites. Uh, culture to me is about a whole way of life uh, and uh, the various symbols and other features of that way of life which uh, make, uh, uh, in a sense, give meaning uh, to existence around. And I think that that definition of culture is something uh, which is uh, very important for the cohesion of a society. And I think there is an alternative definition of military targets which, which say uh, we go for the cultural sites because that is what gives meaning and coherence to a population. So there is a theory of military warfare which actually turns out not to have worked very well which said that you demoralize a society by attacking its cultural institutions. And in World War II, uh, this was carried out with something which was called Baedeker bombing uh, of Britain. Now, I remember this because as a child of uh, seven years old, uh, I was evacuated to uh, a, a country town in the west of uh, England called Gloucester, which is about 40 miles from uh, a major city of Bristol. And I do recall being taken up onto the roof of the house uh, that uh, we were living in and being shown uh, a, a big yellow glow in the sky, which turned out to be the bombing of Bristol. Uh, that uh, and the idea was that uh, the way you would demoralize a population was to, to destroy the centers of the major cultural cities of Britain. And Bristol, starting with B, was one of them. Uh, C came shortly afterwards, and so Canterbury was attacked, which is a beautiful cathedral city, and miraculously, somehow or other, uh, the cathedral did not get hit. Coventry, which was another city, uh, was, uh, was unfortunately uh, hit. And the destruction of Coventry Cathedral was one of the iconic moments in the German bombing of Britain, where, you know, they went from A to B to C, and they were obviously headed, and the other things intervened, and so they stopped it. But the other thing uh, that became clear was that this did not actually uh, dispirit or decompose uh, the will of the British people. In fact, uh, bombing institutions of that kind seems to have strengthened the opposition, uh, that people who valued those institutions uh, were, were mad as hell, uh, collaborated, got together, and, and actually so it created uh, far more social and political solidarities than uh, it destroyed. Uh, unfortunately, the U.S. and the British did not understand that because when they decided to try to demoralize the German population, they also did so by doing uh, huge uh, bombing attacks which obliterated and destroyed the main cultural cities uh, in Germany. The famous one, of course, was the firebombing of Dresden, which Kurt Vonnegut uh, made the centerpiece of his... Uh, uh, novel, and uh, the firebombing of uh, Dresden destroyed all of the cultural institutions in a major, in a major ki kind of way. So this then leads into a kind of an interesting kind of question from the standpoint of uh, both uh, economic and political and cultural logic, as to in what sense uh, culture as a way of life. Uh, is uh, going to be attacked by uh, militarily and in what ways can, can military interventions uh, attack uh, cultural institutions. Now, my, my experience of this is, uh, you know, 
several times in you know having been in the in the British situation in World War Two, and having seen uh, events of this kind. Uh, but one of the things that struck me in most recent times was the attempt uh, by both Saddam in Iraq and then after Erdogan in Turkey to destroy the Kurdish culture and Kurdish aspirations by attempting to dis dis dismantle uh, their culture. Now, here we have a different definition of culture than simply a matter of destroying the main sites, the cathedrals or the, the main institutions. Uh, to some degree, uh, we've seen that happening, and uh, my main experience of this is uh, in, in Turkey, uh, with uh, the struggle going on between the Turkish government and the Kurdish population, which dominates uh, in the east and southeast of, uh, of Turkey uh, around certain cities, uh, Diyarbakir being the, the main uh, Kurdish, Kurdish city. But the attack, which, uh, which uh, has been uh, long-lasting in both uh, northern Iraq and in Turkey against the Kurdish population uh, attempted uh, to tackle uh, the situation by destroying the economic basis. Uh, and that was, in effect, the culture that was attacked. Um, and in, uh, in, in the Kurd, what's called the Kurdistan part of, of Turkey, uh, a lot of this basis lay in an agrarian way of life with villages which were, you know, had a, had a long, long history. And one of the things that Erdogan did and, 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 and the Turkish government did was to try to destroy uh, the livelihood in, in the, the village areas uh, of Kurdistan. And one of the ways to do it was to move in and to say, uh, these villages are nests of terrorists, uh, and there was indeed a guerrilla movement against uh, the Turkish government, which was located uh, in these areas. And so the Turkish military would move in and say, this, is, this village is a nest of terrorists, there's are the terrorist supporters, so we burn down the village and we destroy uh, the, 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 the village life and the village culture. And this is attack upon culture. And, it, and, and it's not simply an economic attack, but it's an attack upon a way of life and a way of living and a way of socializing and the like. So if you take the, way, the, the notion of culture as being about all of those things as they work together, then this was a cultural attack by burning down the village. Now, what would happen would be the, 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 when, the, when the military came in, they would kill people, but the people would flee off into the mountains and waiting for the military to disappear. Their village was burned down. They would come back and they would rebuild their village. And then two years later, the military would come back and burn it down again. And so this was uh, a systematic uh, attack. Uh, and uh, after a while, uh, the Kurds would get dispirited and the Kurds would move into the cities. And so the villages would get depopulated. The way of life, which was built around the village culture, would start to disappear. Uh, and so, uh, in a sense, uh, Kurdish society would be bereft of its cultural roots. The other way in which the, the, the Turkish government uh, decided to take care of this was by constructing dams. Now, this is a, an interesting story in its own right. Uh, because the arable land upon which the Kurds relied was in the river valleys. And if you came along and said, actually, we need those river valleys because we need to generate hydroelectric power, so we put a dam at the bottom of the valley, and then all the arable land disappears underwater, then the Kurds lose their, 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 the capacity of their agrarian uh, life. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, huge dams which are being constructed uh, in south and uh, in east and southeast Turkey, uh, have everything to do with 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 destroying that that basis of uh, of of agrarian life of the Kurdish society. But they also had another uh, uh, purpose, which was a military purpose.
because, yes, there was a Kurdish guerrilla movement. The Kurdish guerrilla movement was very nifty in terms of its capacity to move around in mountainous regions. It could move from one mountainside to another mountainside very easily. Uh, but if you put a large body of water there, you could actually disrupt uh, the capacity for the Kurdish guerrillas to move around and, and uh, you could easily uh, patrol the waters. And so uh, actually the, the dams which uh, were set up in uh, east and southeast Turkey uh, had very much to do with military control and the control of the movement of, uh, as well as the erosion and the destruction of the Kurdish villages as a way of, as a way of life. So this definition of a way of life leads us into the kind of question as to what is it that 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 uh, that Trump said in this supposedly barbaric statement uh, in which he threatened cultural sites with obliteration. Because actually, when you look at it, economy and the pr promotion of certain economy has also been about the promotion of a certain way of life and the destruction of an older way of life. And now, Margaret Thatcher said something very interesting in her, her whole kind of uh, rhetoric about neoliberalism, kind of saying neoliberalism is not only an economic project. She said it's about changing the soul. It's actually about changing the culture. And Margaret Thatcher was out to change the culture and to try to create a neoliberal culture on the, on the basis that the neoliberal culture would be more relevant to a capitalist society than the kind of solidarity cultures that existed uh, in the societies uh, which were displaced uh, in the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s by the rise of the neoliberal order. Now, on this topic, it seems to me that actually this is where Trump's kind of commentary that he was going to go after the cultural sites is, I think, rather telling. Because I think what Trump is really about, and one of his powers, actually, is his ability to transform the cultural context in which we live our lives. But Trump wants to actually create an alternative culture. And on that front, he has been extremely successful. And we've got to think about this, because... It's that cultural shift which seems to now allow us to be talking about white supremacy. It allows us to think about racist kind of connotations. It's a different approach to the status of women, which, by the way, is very much embedded in cultural forms. And to do something which is radically different. And so Trump is about doing what Margaret Thatcher also was about, which is to try to transform the way in which people thought about the world, the way in which they thought about themselves in relationship to that world, the cultural features of their daily life which they valued, the cultural features that people were willing to abandon. And we've seen an abandonment of certain cultural values under Trump. We've seen aban an abandonment of uh, many ways of, uh, of, of, of thinking so that the cultural transformation that that Trump was arguing for is something which is, a, I think, a very vital uh, aspect of his politics. And it's something which is not really truly discussed in, I think, a sufficiently uh, cogent way. So let me go back, if you like, to the whole kind of question of, of Iraq and Iran and, and, and all the rest of it. Because when the, uh, the, 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 the provisional co coalition authority was set up after the occupation of Iraq. Uh, the U.S. agent, a man called Bremer, who came in to head up that provisional coalition authority, issued certain edicts about the way of life that should be constructed in Iraq. And it was a set of edicts which were drawn from neoliberalism, and it was, and it said basically, all state property has to be privatized. Everything has to go through the private sector. We need to privatize the economy. There has to be open competition uh, going on. Uh, the the state must not interfere in the operation of a market economy. Uh, all economic activities should be open to foreign investment. There should be no 
uh, barriers to the repatriation of profits out of Iraq to foreign companies and foreign firms. Um, and there should be a strict uh, regulation of labor laws and labor organization uh, so that there will be re you know, restrictions over the possibility of forming trade unions. In other words, what Bremer tried to impose upon Iraq was a whole neoliberal culture. And many people uh, within Iraq looked at this and said, that's not our culture. That's not the way we do things. That's not the way in which we trade. That's not the way in which we operate. And, and therefore, uh, there was a total mismatch between the imposition of a certain eco economic order on Iraq and the cultural forms uh, within which that uh, order was supposed to, to operate. And this attempt to impose neoliberal structures uh, on Iraq uh, was uh, modeled, actually, uh, very much upon uh, what uh, Pinochet had done in Chile. Uh, after the Allende years and the Pinochet, Pinochet kind of restructured Chile uh, around this neoliberal model, which uh, was uh, you know, based, based upon uh, Chicago economic uh, theory. And you get a, the kind of rise of a neoliberal order in Chile, which is successful to the degree that it did what it was supposed to do, and which what neoliberalism was all about along, which is to develop a society in which the, the capitalist class uh, could implant itself, flourish, and start to dominate uh, the society, which uh, is what happened in Chile. What happened in Iraq was that was never really working terribly well, except that basically the government of Iraq essentially took over uh, the the sort of neoliberal thing and did what the neoliberals always do, which turns government into a kleptocracy. In other words, the government became a kind of center of a, uh, of a amassing of fortunes and amassing of a great deal of wealth uh, and power. So it, what you see happening in Iraq is similar to what, what was done in Chile, except it didn't work very well in Iraq because it didn't embed very well in the culture. And so there's a lot of conflict which goes on in Iraq around this economic model being superimposed at the same time as there is a conflict going on between the Shias and the Sunnis in, in Iraq. And so there's a kind of interesting sort of, sort of conflation between an economic conflict on the one hand and a religious conflict on the other. Now, there have been a lot of problems in terms of the Iraqi economy, serious problems in the, in the Iraqi case. The, Ira the Iraqi economy is not working. It's not working even as well as it was working under the, the, the Saddam era. In fact, there's a certain nostalgia uh, in Iraq for the, no, for, the, for the Saddam era because at least uh, the water came uh, and the electricity worked and, uh, you know, basic services uh, were available. Well, a lot of that has not worked ex very well at all under these rules of privatization and, and uh, the imposition of the rules of a market uh, economy. So uh, what people in Iraq are now finding is that they are not, you know, the economic model which has been superimposed upon them is not working. And so there is a revolt against that economic model and those who are running that economic model, which is essentially a kleptocratic government. Now, if you read the New York Times and say to yourself, what does the New York Times tell us about what's going on in Iraq? You hear that there's a great deal of popular discontent, but it's largely phrased in terms of a conflict between Sunnis and Shias. It's a religious conflict. That's where the conflict lies. Well, actually, it doesn't lie there at all. A lot of people on the ground in, in Iraq are saying to themselves that it's not this kind of question of the Sunnis versus the Shias. The problem is we've got a kleptocratic government which is trying to operate with neoliberal rules, and those neoliberal rules are extremely successful in concentrating all the wealth and power in a small autocracy uh, at the top, and it's that autocratic government that we're challenging. So the big challenges on the street in uh, in in uh, Baghdad right now are from pov impoverished areas which are mobilizing against uh, the government and the popular areas are mobilizing together both Sunnis and Shias. It's a secular movement against uh, a form of government uh, 
which is essentially the neoliberal structure of government imposed uh, by, by the Americans uh, after the, the occupation. Now, what is fascinating to me, that at the very same moment, that these hundreds and thousands of people are taken to the streets in protest in, in Baghdad and being met by a great deal of violence by police action. And some 200 or who knows, maybe 250 people have been killed in, in, in Baghdad in this, in this, uh, this, this revolt against, against the government. Now, this government uh, is uh, now in, in real trouble and has partially uh, collapsed in the face of this, uh, of, of, of this fight. Now, at the same time that this is going on in, in Baghdad, so, interestingly, the same thing is happening in Santiago in Chile. Because in, in Chile, a very successful neoliberal government has operated but is operated according to neoliberal rules with neoliberal results, which is the concentration of an immense amount of wealth at the top of the uh, social structure. And the capitalist class and the, the corporate class has done extremely well in Chile. Meanwhile, basic education is lacking. Pensions rights are, uh, are, are, are appalling. Uh, social uh, wages are, are, are falling apart. In other words, you have the demand in Chile for an alternative economy, an alternative economy which is delivering some level of, uh, uh, of services to the mass of the population at the same time as it's also uh, delivering uh, the, uh, the possibility of a decent education, a decent daily life uh, to the mass of the population, which is what neoliberalism has never, ever been about. And the culture which is required for that, that uh, neoliberalism is, is, is missing. And in exactly the same way that the mass bombing of Dresden and the mass bombing of, uh, of uh, cultural sites in, in, in Britain did not demoralize the population, so neoliberalism uh, with its mass uh, of, uh, uh, of power going on does not demoralize the mass of the population uh, in either Baghdad or in uh, uh, Santiago. So we find actually a revolt going on among secular movements in both Baghdad and in Santiago, uh, which are essentially revolts against the neoliberal form of government and against the culture that that neoliberal form of government seeks to impose. Now, at the same time as that is going on, we find the same phenomena going on in places like Beirut, it's going on in Paris. It's going on in many, many other parts of the world. And this, I think, gives me some level of encouragement that the cultural transformation, uh, which is necessary to support uh, a neoliberal order, has not been completely ordered. But at the same time as we're seeing uh, the attempt to impose a different cultural order, uh, and that that is one of the items that Margaret Thatcher attempted and is one of the things that, of course, Donald Trump is attempting in the United States <clears throat> with some degree of success in both instances. So uh, the idea that there's something barbaric about tr uh, Trump trying to transform uh, Iranian culture by attacking cultural sites uh, is actually the same as Trump trying to, uh, if you like, transform American culture. And what we're seeing in the United States is at least in, in some people's words is about trying to say we have to rescue America uh, and Americans uh, from this barbaric transform cultural transformation which uh, Trump is, seems to be involved in conducting. So that, it seems to me, is a very important issue that we need to look at. But in the process of looking at it, we need to be fully aware of the relationships between cultural forms and economic forms and how the transformation of economic forms involves cultural transformations and how cultural transformations have economic implications. And that seems to me to be one of the things we have to do uh, if we want a better society is to understand that relationship more clearly. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.